Hey, thank you, Bill. The uh, the uh, what really happened now? The the committee did a time study, and they calculated we'd get out here Tuesday at noon. <laughs> so they said, "Get on up, boy." So we uh, yeah, just to add to one thing to what he what he said. When we're on a particular topic, let's let's focus that topic. Then we'll we'll move through more effectively, probably more efficiently. That's, that's really what we're trying to do. Because you can, and, and I'm a glutton for it. I can we could go on for a week, literally, and not even slow down. So, but if we're just whatever topic we're on, just to try to stay within that bracket, then we'll move to another one pretty quickly. What time we quit? At uh, what time is it? Huh? Four. Oh, yeah, great. 20 to 11. That's for poor folks. <laughs> like me. I can't do 5 to 12. Will you give me a high sign in case I happen to get caught up in what I'm doing? Okay, I appreciate it. I had, that's what they did at the International. You know, I was trying, I was just getting ready to start, and that guy was over there. <laughs> so I, I responded to that. <laughs> Uh, well, good session, guys. When I finished the session sweating, I, th I think it's, it worked out pretty good. So uh, I appreciate the engagement. I really like to see that. The old saying, you get out of it what you put in it, is so true. Well, yeah, can, so. I, can I just ask one question? Yeah. I'm not to Brandon Silver today by Grace Scott and I'll follow up on this. I just want to know where the circle started when we stand up and do this right here. Now, I've heard, I've heard, now I don't know if it's true or not. Some group in Texas, some Texans stood up and said, Why don't we all just hold hands like we do the Lord's Prayer? Now, I don't know if that's true, and I would just like to know if you have your opinion or you know. All it is is an opinion, but I think, like a lot of, of relatively modern stuff, started in treatment. It's a part of what they do in group therapy to get the, the trust and get the level of communication up. The, the, the chanting, same thing, yeah, this, 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 this same kind of stuff. I think most of that originated when we started getting a, an influx from that kind of a sort. Yeah, I, now, I, I go to Texas an awful lot, and they swore to me that they had never done anything to wrinkle the, the water. Or, so I trust them because they'll shoot you if you don't. <laughs> I, I tell you what, what they know, there's subtle ways to deal with stuff. Well, we, 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 in our group, we didn't much like it. If you read the promises, and then, uh, are these exactly probably, and then the, the Hallelujah Chorus says, we think, <laughs> well, we didn't like that, but we didn't want to create a brouhaha, so we just took that part off the end of the promises and cut it off. <laughs> it's really funny to watch people reading. <laughs> Didn't he have to call a business meeting? We just did it. <laughs> There's always a way to do stuff, you know. Uh, what it was, Sorry, what it was trying to do. Booby trap. Oh, it's hey, fun. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he'll never bring me anything else. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Yeah, I appreciate that. Oh man, yeah. I don't. I'm not, yeah, I'm not as big as I look. <laughs> yeah, I think that's gonna work great. Good deal, buddy. Uh, it's what it's trying to do, and I really appreciate that open interchange we do. But it really does kind of wreak havoc with the schedule. The uh, it was trying to get into uh, focus on on the big book step type stuff we were working yesterday. Then we'll move into the other phases. I just kind of marked them out, you know. And so we'll we'll try to focus on on, the, on those particular areas. And uh, the uh, one one of Mentioned a little bit. We're talking about, like the thing we read last night about about David and what happened to him, and about getting involved in the whole program. And we we talked a, a, a fair amount about that on on the amends process and how critical that is. You know, and it's just a part of the deal, but a vitally important part of the deal. 
and uh, had a good, in fact, Brian and I had a good talk about, about uh, the, the men's over a cup of coffee that I bought, by the way. <laughs> and uh, so it is, it's a, it's a tremendously important part of the program. The, uh, let me run that down to you just, 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 uh, cause I didn't do it there. I, you, you know, yesterday that, uh, yeah, I told you that, that, that I was institutionalized because of uh, doing the thing that God knows alcoholics do every day uh, you know, around, around the world. And that's causing folks to die, you know, just by the that, that stupid thing of driving blind drunk. And, uh, you know, that was a kind of thing. I, I, I'll just walk you through that just to kind of, kind of illustrate how it can work. If you really try to do what's laid out in this, and, and, try, and really try to practice program. You know, I was obviously, well, I don't know if it was obvious or not, but I was tremendously uh, shattered. I mean, I, I simply was really, really, really uh, uh, could not handle that very well. But even as, just as a human being, even as a drunk, I knew that I needed to make some kind of gesture to the families that were left. It was two young people, two different families. And I knew I needed to make amends. And I had some of the guys, you know, street people are funny people. They uh, they rob you one day, but they'll lay down <coughs> lay down for you the next day. And, and so I had some guys that came in from the street just to, just to come over by and see me. And I asked one one of them to contact the families for me and ask if they would be willing to hear from me. Both families quite understandably said no. That was very understandable. And so now that was before I ever heard of AA. Just as a human being, I did that. And, uh, but they said no. So that closes the deal, eh? You know, just like it says in, in, in the immense part in the book, that we don't, we don't relieve our pain at somebody else's expense. And we can't force the issue the people that are not ready to accommodate it. And so I had, I had to respect that. But that doesn't make it go away. And so when I got in the program, started hearing about amends, uh, my God, I listened, listened hungrily to everything I heard tried about everything I heard that made any sense at all. And, uh, you know, a certain amount I could do directly to the victims in terms of, you know, praying with their image in mind, writing to them, you know, a number of things like that. Also made up, a, I, I, I don't mess with the steps much at all, but I, on the eighth step, I, I added something to a step, and that's unusual. But where it says we uh, made a list of people who were harmed and, and became willing to make amends to them all, behind willing, I put the word opportunity. Mm-hmm. And I added that. <clears throat> As a part of, the, of, of my prayer was for willingness and opportunity. Now, I promise you, I never did anything to make it happen. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, I continued with the direct. I made up my mind to do indirect amends to, to them. You know that... You know, the book refers to indirect amends. And you can do it. Sometimes you can't make, like a victim in something like that, you can't make direct amends. So make the indirect. And uh, I'll just finish that part with, uh, it's amazing. That accident happened on the 3rd of May of 56. You could not believe the number of things that have happened on the 3rd of May that were absolutely, undeniably, directly related to what happened. And, uh, you know, I spoke to 5,000 young people in one day, just about the age of the ones that, that died in that accident. And, uh, and I spoke about, you know, the drunk driving and the hazards and stuff like this and about alcoholism. And I didn't plan that. You know, do two groups of 2,500. I, I planned none of it whatsoever. I did a, a, I did a televised interview on the... Uh, the public television the thing that, yeah, I did a, 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 a televised interview that uh, the fellow told me that the anonymity would be absolutely guaranteed, you know, because, I mean, I didn't mind it, it, it saying to the world, but I, I, I really, really believe in anonymity and the value, of not only to me, but to the fellowship. And, and so I, I, he promised he'd be an anonymous, changed my voice, Use that, I call it Rubik's Cube thing where they put the colors there and they kind of move. He said, nobody will be able to identify you. And uh, <laughs> he didn't know alcoholics, I, I swear. <laughs> I, that thing, several months later, I got a call from a woman in North Dakota. And she said, said, Tom, did you make a movie? 
I said, I said, have you lost your mind? Of course I didn't make a movie. What are you talking about? And she said, well, I saw this thing, and then it dawned on me. She said, I saw this thing on public television. I said, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about, and I did. And I said, well, how did you know it was me? There was supposed to be nothing identifiable. She said, I recognized your nose. <laughs> I said, my God, girl, is it that bad? She said, well, pretty bad. <laughs> But I mean, that was just one of many, you know, and, and just on and on and on with so many things that have come up spontaneously. On third, and I've never planned a single one. Everything that happens continues to. So the indirect means, and I'll let you know a little secret, it's part of what I'm doing here. You know, I don't have zeal ten times that of an average man just because I'm a dedicated idiot. They're direct demands associated. You'd be amazed at how many people I meet going around all over the place that... Uh, have done something like I did and, quote, got away with it. Without exception, they're the most tortured people <coughs> that I've ever seen. And just the opportunity to deal with it. And who knows? You know, it, it could be an influencing factor to some people. So it's a part of, of the, of the <coughs> of indirect, not a guilt trip, but it's just a part of the uh, indirect amend. The real question was the families, though, and... and uh, because the, 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 the families were, they had already said, we don't want to hear from this fellow. And so I put that willing in there and prayed that way. Never knew if anything would happen. And so a couple of years after I was out, something like that, I got a phone call from an attorney in Flint, Michigan. And he uh, identified himself, and he said, I'm representing the families that, that, uh, that in that accident you had here. And... Uh, he said they have entered a lawsuit based on the notion that what happened wasn't really your fault, that, that the young folks were trying to cross the street and they jumped back to avoid another vehicle, jumped into mine. Well, just a natural human reaction, I thought, oh, my God, yeah, you know, it's like, like I'm getting a, a sort of a pardon you know, in, in that thing. And it, but that didn't last two seconds. And I thought, my God, that doesn't change anything. You can't mitigate some guy driving blind drunk <coughs> down the main street of a city. There is no mitigation for that. I mean, that just stand, speaks for itself. And, and so, uh, so he told me they were going to do that. He said they, they think they would like to have you come up and testify to trial. And I said, well, I'd, I'd be happy to do anything, but I've got nothing to offer. You know, I mean, my testimony at my own trial, I couldn't even testify there other than just say, I'm sorry, I don't know. And that's the hell of blackouts, is I don't know. And so I said, I'd be glad to come. And they said, well, he said, they think it'll help. And I said, okay, I'll be there. So I went. Now, you talk about an eerie feeling for a thousand reasons. But, but one, I, w I walked in. The hearing was to be held in the same courtroom where I was convicted. And, and boy, you, you talk about <laughs> an eerie feeling. It's like walking across your own grave almost uh, and walking back in there. Sat down, and uh, they had a, a section for the families, and then I sat in the same section but separated. You know, you don't normally, uh, uh, you don't connect offender and offended. It, it just isn't done. And, and so they went through the trial. I testified exactly like I knew it would be. I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm not doing anything I can't help, but I don't know. And uh, I know this is not supposed to happen, but I prayed for opportunity, and I got it. I didn't know it. I'm sitting there. I had no earthly idea I'd be able to do anything. Families and I hadn't spoken to each other. And um, the bailiff came over, the guy that you was know, in charge of the court, uh, the decorum of the court. He came over and he, he said something to the families and then gestured, and they went down the hall. So I figured it was a potty break. And so they, they went down the hall. And then he came back and came over to me. And extended the same courtesy, I thought. And he said, he said uh, come on down. And so I went down. And, uh, I tell you, if, if you pray for opportunity, you better be prepared. Because you never know when it's going to happen. Now, I went down that hall and thinking I'm going to the John. And uh, he came to a door. He opened it and gestured. And so I looked in. I mean, it doesn't take long to read a scene. You know, I, I stepped in. And all at once I saw the two families, one in one corner, with one, one across on the other side. They weren't together. They were separate. And uh, the minute I saw it, man, it looked like the whole world was a flashbulb, flash just a total shock. 
you know, of that. And my first thought was run, run. It was not step in, I, I promise you that. And, uh, and I said, well, to myself, looks like your prayers have been answered, buddy. <clears throat> Either move in or, or boogie. And so I went in. Went over to the first family, asked if I could speak to them. And I swear to God, I'll never understand it, but they welcomed me as if I were family. I mean, absolutely, just like family. Warm, loving, forgiving. I wasn't asking for anything except for them to let me <clears throat> uh, talk to them. And so they were absolutely uh, uh, un uh, unbelievable. You know, we hugged each other and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, man, alive, this is something. And then I went over to the other family, and they were, uh, they were an Eastern Euro European uh, family, for the first generation immigrant from somewhere in the Eastern Bloc. And um, so I went over, and, and they were a paternal group, you know, and so they were in a circle. And, and when they saw me coming across the floor, they, they, they knew what I was doing, I guess, and they uh, figured it out. The father stepped out of the circle and met me. We shook hands, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I, I said, would it be possible to speak to the family? And he went back into the family group you know, to ask, I guess, and they, they, uh, they, they did a, a group conference. And, and he came back out and he said, no, you, you can't speak to the family, <coughs> speak to me. <coughs> I said, okay, and did. And you know, I just said to him everything I wanted to say. <coughs> very courteous, very considerate. And we got through, he said, uh, we can't forgive. And I wasn't asking for forgiveness. I was just asking to, to, to let me let me speak to you. But nonetheless, that's what he said. We can't forgive. Please don't bother us again. Well, that's been many years. You know, and and I, I, I've never had another opportunity. I may, who knows? It may someday. You know, all of us are getting pretty old. But if, if it comes, I'll be ready. If not, you know, then, then I will have done exactly what Step said. We make the amends wherever possible. <clears throat> except when the, it would do so would injure them or others. And that doesn't include me. That, that, that includes them. And, and so I've, I've had to leave it there. And, and so, but it takes care of, of everything I can do without violating the principle and, and taking advantage of somebody. So I, I, I share that because I know that I'm not the only guy that's carried around heavy-duty guilt that, need, that where amends are needed. And I, I think I made it pretty clear in a couple of those cases I mentioned that it is my fervent belief that freedom never comes as long as we're dragging those things that we wish we could forget. I don't think it ever comes. You know, because you'll always have that little thing to kind of eat your lunch on a regular basis. And, and so I, they're, they're, I, I, I do call those the freedom steps because I think that's exactly what they, what they lead to. And being able to, uh, to move on to, to getting the, the business of living underway. The, uh, I'm just going to skip through some of that. Now, and any, on any of these things that I'm dealing with, there, if any, any, any questions, just give me a signal. And we'll stop. Let's just stick to the topic on that. And that was about the immense process. So, so anybody who wants to comment or question anything on that thing, have at it. Yeah. Quick question. Just about, you know, you were saying about do the opportunity arise? Uh, how many incidents do the opportunity arise? Well, that, that one only came to one time. Oh, it was in probably... Like about how many years period from the accident till the time you took your steps till the time you named step nine? It would have probably been... My question is, did you push it? Huh? Did you push it? Did you try to... I didn't have to. No, I didn't have to. You know, they'd already said, don't come to us. Yeah. They'd already said, you have to honor that. Yeah. And so I didn't. I just prayed for... Hey. It took time. Well, I prayed for opportunity. I, I could explain their behavior, but they both families agreed to see me. And that opportunity, they didn't plan that trial just so I could be there. But it was a marvelous opportunity. Eh? It was a marvelous opportunity. How many years was it, Tom, after like, the accident was in 56? When was this lawsuit trial? Do you remember? It, yeah, it would have been probably the early 60s. Oh. Yeah, yeah, because I, I couldn't do anything while I was locked up directly. 
and I, I was able to do stuff indirectly. But yeah, it was. Uh, I was. I was out. I. Th I think I was probably two years on the street when that came up. A year and a half, two years. So but in other words, what you're saying is time makes a difference. Time makes a difference. Yeah. I was ready as soon as I read the amend steps. I was ready then. But but the situation was not ready then. But you placed yourself in a position at one point in time in step three, right? Mm -hmm. By turning your will and life mm -hmm. over to care of God. Yeah. And then you waited for the yeah. opportunity to arise. But in between, there was a gap, a big gap, right? So what I'm asking you is, like, time makes a difference, or is it just... Mm -hmm. Well, I, I could have made... I could have made amends before I got in AA, but it would have been crude and ugly. I wouldn't have known how to do it. It would harm yeah. the others. Hey? It would harm the others. Yeah, it, it would have been it would have been maudlin emotional stuff. It, it would not have been clear communication. You know, what the program prepared me to be able to make honest amends and not impose more grief on people. And so that I think that was the value of the time. But the you know the, the steps lead us to the process. I was prepared to make amends in a healthy way, and uh, so when that opportunity came, it, I had no hesitation whatsoever. You know, you're just a it was an automatic thing. Just like I mentioned in an earlier session, each step prepares us for the next step, and you know, like six gets us ready to get rid of the defects. Seven guides us to eight and nine, and uh, you know, I think that's God's answer to the prayer. You know, and then. Uh, so it just it falls in. Some time. Sorry? It did take some time. It was not an overnight thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, it took a while. It took a while. A few years or... Yeah. Yeah, and, and it was it was just a matter of the timing. I mean, you can't yank around a family that's been into that much grief. You can't yank them around. And I don't think anybody set that up just so I could make amends. Well, maybe they did, but it wasn't anybody in the court. It was my boss. Yeah, my boss had taken me a lot of places I wasn't supposed to go, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> including there. <Yeah. laughs> that was tremendous, obviously, very valuable kind of a thing. And um, yeah, that just like I mentioned, the people I run into who, who've never dealt with that thing, it doesn't go away. I guarantee you that doesn't go away. And those are tortured folk, tortured folk. That, anybody else? Anything on that? Yeah. Did you have this much patience 30 years ago? Did you Say it again now. Did you have as much patience and understanding in the program 30 years ago as you do today? I think I did. I, I really do. But, well, you got to realize where I started from. I wasn't a, a, an active businessman or a hardworking somebody. I'm dead meat. I'm done. And so I had. I didn't have any impatience much, you know, that... Yeah, everything for me was 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 beyond my imagination. So I I, I didn't have a lot of trouble with impatience. I, I really wasn't. The uh, you know when I was serving my time, I, I mean I hated it, but I made every day count. You know, it was worthwhile. Every day was a rewarding day for me, even in those conditions. And and so I never have had a. I got a lot of patience with me. I'm not always patient with other people, <laughs> but, but no, it, uh, it never was. It never was a huge problem to me. And something like making amends, I was well aware that I had to wait for the time. And I wasn't sure it would ever happen. I was resigned to that. I was not sure it would ever happen. And when it did, man, I'm telling you, that, that, uh, that was just unbelievable. Uh, but it happened exactly the way I just told you, exactly that way. It's a good thing I wasn't planning the recovery. <laughs> I, I doubt I would have, would have made the plan like it turned out to be. But that it introduced me to life I didn't even know existed. Yeah, that, but all that's part of it. You know, that, yeah. like I, I was talking with Brian and we were talking about immense that, uh, you know, that was tough emotionally, to, tough to deal with that. But some of the most difficult amends that I had to make were to my own family. That you, that my family, just like my mother, for example, she thought I was a fine boy. Yeah, she, she never believed I was an alcoholic. I was, I was living at her house after I got out one day. She was on the phone with a neighbor. No, in a room with a neighbor, not on the phone. And they were talking about their prior children. And, and the woman said, 
why does your son travel so much? <laughs> and mother said, oh, he's in that AA thing. And she said, oh, is he an alcoholic? My mother said, oh, no. No. <laughs> 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 And he was always a good boy. <laughs> uh, what are you going to do with bugs? <laughs> so, it's, it's amazing. But that was hard. I almost had to hold her. I was telling him, I almost had to hold her to make amends. Yeah, I had a picture of that. <laughs> it was a Canadian photograph you know, at, at, at uh, Niagara Falls or the Queen or somebody. And I, I was admiring it in her house. And I said, you know, that's a beautiful picture. She said, you ought to like it. You sent it to me. <laughs> I said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I had no clue. And uh, one day she's telling me how, how, how it wasn't that bad. I was really a pretty guy. She said, you know, you sent me that money uh, for, all, for all those years. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> so when I'd gone in the military, I must have been drunk. I signed over what they call an allotment. To her, she got a check every month that it was off defending my country, laying flat on my back. <laughs> and uh, my first instinct, old habits die hard, my first instinct was, well, give me the money. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't do it. Yeah. I tell you, it's tricky, but, but that weird stuff. But it's amazing the, the, the difficulty people have accepted. Because the thing is, is, is what I was telling him, it, it's like you're, you're having a sword fight with somebody with no sword. You know, they have no program. I have a program, so the, 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 the responsibility is overwhelmingly in my court, not them. And so I've got to be patient and help them understand the process. They don't understand it. It is a foreign thing. They're not used to that. They're used to getting me out of jail. You know, and so... Very, very, di uh, had more difficulty with them. I'll tell you one other one. It was a, a man's thing that, that, that had a lot of meaning to me. Early on, when, when I first hit, uh, hit the street, I'd had a boss one time that, uh, not one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my life, and I'd ripped him off for a little bit of money. It wasn't much. Yeah, it did. I mean, he had a lot of money, and I didn't, so it seemed just to me to take the money. And so... He was on my mind, and he was, he was high on my list of people I needed to see just because he was such a good guy. And uh, so when I got out, it wasn't a whole lot of money, but I didn't have that much, so I borrowed the money. Now, this is not good business, you know, unless you're talking about amends. You know, I borrowed the money to make amends for taking the money. And uh, <laughs> so I went over there to the, to the place where I'd worked, and I thought, sure, everybody would just jump on me the minute they walked in the door and said, well, you scoundrel, you finally have gotten justice or something. You know, that. I walked in, the old secretary had been there longer than the building, and uh, <laughs> she didn't know me. <laughs> Probably looked different. <laughs> but but it, it, I said, uh, I'd, I'd like to see Mr. Brown if I could. That's the owner. She said, well, he's very busy. And I said, well, <laughs> I understand that. But I need to see him. It's about some money I owe him. And uh, she said, well, that's the magic word. you know." So she said, I'll see if he can see you. So he went in, and he agreed to see me. And I went in, and he was really a nice man. There's one reason he was a high was a really nice man. And so I went in, and he was sitting behind a huge desk, and he was a small guy, but he was sitting behind that little desk, glasses on, and he didn't know me either. <laughs> I've been carrying it for years and he's sleeping every night he did so anyway I went in and told him what I'm doing and uh, he didn't catch on at first you know and, and so I told him it's about some money money I owe you that I ripped off when I was here and he had absolutely no memory of any of it and he said well look I appreciate you coming in but I can't take that money I said, what do you mean take, can't take it as yours? I said, that's not mine. And he said, it'll screw up my bookkeeping, quite frankly. And I said, I'm sorry about that, but it's screwing up my life. I've got to do something. So, so I hadn't told him, you know, the preliminaries of it. I told him, I said, let me tell you really why I'm doing this now. And I was just sort of like going in man to man. So I told him what I was doing. 
He reached up to his glasses off. He said, well, I'll be dark. He said, I've been in business 40 years. I have never seen anything like this. I said, me either. <laughs> and so, but, but we hit it off. And from then on, every time I'd go to Charlotte, where that business was, he had a certain place he liked to eat lunch. And I would always go in there if I was in Charlotte. And if he would see me, <coughs> excuse me, he would always come across the dining room and say, greet me and say, how's that work of yours going? You know, that's a, that was his code. I said, great. That's the amends, eh? <coughs> the, the healing, the reunion, you know, the cleanness that comes. Absolutely vital. I think vital stuff. I'm sorry about all this gaggy, but I, I dwell on that a little bit because it is, and I appreciate you asking that, too. That, that is really, a, a, to me, a very vital part of recovery. There's a lot of things that ain't. I was at a conference somewhere down in Texas, and uh, I, I saw a beautiful Jaguar sitting over there. And, uh, and uh, what well, is a handsome rod. I went over and took a look. On the front of the, the vanity plate, it said, Step 9. <laughs> I said, oh, I've got to meet this boy. Tell us, I found him, and I said, boy, that's a great jag you got there. Tell me about that plate. <laughs> he said, well, he said, I bought that car and paid for it, and that's amends to me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, it's a good try, old buddy, but it has nothing to do with amends. You know, <laughs> don't dignify it with that. You just bought a car, for God's sake. You know, don't, don't crash it that way. <laughs> so, anything, anybody else see anything on, on amends? Yeah, right? Did he take the money or did he take it? He took it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Not the Jaguar guy. Yes. It took me a long time to realize that making amends is for my benefit, not for the benefit of the I don't think the fellowship stresses enough the idea that one, the promises come midway through making the amends, mm-hmm. and two, that it's mostly freedom from fear of retaliation from the people that we harm, mm-hmm. and that's the freedom that we get. So it's for my benefit. If I can keep that in mind when I'm making the amends, I'm not asking for forgiveness, I'm not asking them to respond in a certain way, and I'm not reinforcing their resentment when they don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very good point. It is, it's, uh, it's uh, that I'm the winner. I'm the winner. You know, whether the other person accepts it, rejects it, or whatever, I'm the winner, but I make the effort. It's about, the book makes it very clear, it's about cleaning my side of the street. And the response of the other person has nothing to do with the value of it. I mean, they may you know, make it fun or, or, or not, but, but the, otherwise, they don't affect the quality of the amendment. And so I learned that for doggone sure. So if you're sitting on some and not moving on them, for God's sake, move on them. It, it, it is absolutely the key to me, to what freedom's all about. Yeah, Mark. I'm going to ask you something personal. Um, what has happened? I you share personal stuff about yourself. Too, right? What's happened to me in the last four uh, June? June 16th, I think it was 2006. I was in a motor vehicle accident. I was hit by a drunk guy. He was 20 years old. I had uh, 14 fractures. I was in a coma for 14 days. I had a traumatic brain injury. You know, uh, it took me six months, three months before I, my weight buried day before I could get up and walk. I'm going through uh, stuff five years later, four and a half years later. And part of it was is to do with my wife or ex-wife soon to be ex-wife, I don't know which one, <laughs> right? Uh, Bill there was in court with me, Murray was in court with me, Jack F was in court with me. Uh, there were a whole bunch of people, she's dragged me through the court system. She's asked me to do family parenting, this, that, the other, right? And I'm still going through the process. And I have one counselor who keeps telling me that I need to move forward. Right? But I have Jack F, who on the other hand says, because last year I went to a retreat at the participation retreat, and the topic was the spirituality and the steps. And I, I looked at Jack and I said, Jack, 
Can you tell me where there's a spirituality in the steps fit with me here? You know, Mildred was facilitating it with Mahi, right? And um, he said, Man, you're going through the crossfire right now. Right? And uh, basically all you can do is lay low. Right? Uh, a few months ago we went to again in Supreme Court and she's put a hold on half a million dollars. Right? Uh, when I had the car accident, she, she said that I did the car accident. You get an ICBC claim. On my way to Paris in Dana, I'm walking with crutches, and she's asked me to carry furniture up the stairs with 14 fractures. So I still have issues about that stuff, right? And I've kind of bitten into it like a pit bull. You know? And um, when you talk about, you know, forgiveness and stuff like that, right? You know, there's a process to that is uh, the acceptance of the situation first and then the letting go of it. In fact, I was talking to my friend Antonio and Bill and other guys here and asking them what, what did I do? Because Antonio knows me for what, 15 years and he's seen the dynamics, right? He's been like a true brother to me. You know, through, throughout this accident, he's one guy that has stood by me, he's come pick me up, taken me to meetings and all. Right, so where do I stand here? Right? I want to talk to you about this on a one-to-one -one basis. Right? Okay. You know, yeah. but where do I stand? Here? Yeah. You know, how, how do I get over this? Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, let's let's go into that. Let's go. Oh, great, thanks. Let's go into that one-on-one. -on -one. That's kind of a tricky trick. Yeah. Have you heard about the surrogate amends and what's your take the on what that? What kind? Surrogate amends. Surrogate? Yeah. I have not. You never heard that? No. It's like like beer. Sounds like liquor. That, that sounds like left-handed amends to me. <laughs> yeah. No, I've never heard. How long have you explained to me? And I heard on the tape. They yeah. said um, you get someone that had passed away and you had to make an amends. Yeah. And you tell that person how that person is as a personality. Yeah. And then the person would sit down and you can make amends. Say it was like your grandmother. You know, and your grandmother's in the ground, you want to make amends to her. You get a woman that would act out like your grandmother, and you could make the amends to her. And I heard that on a date in uh, Martin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's it's there, it's a tricky deal though like, when you got to go. I'll, I'll just tell you one real quick thing about that. The uh, it, it's not directly that. I sponsor a guy who's about twenty five years sober, and uh, before he came in, before he. Right after he came in AA, he lives out in the country, and uh, a little, little uh, small child, son of his, was riding one of those big wheel type things, you know, and there's very little traffic there. The child rode the thing out on the, the high, on the road, and a guy came around the curve and struck the child and killed him. And uh, now it was a tragic accident, but there was no criminality, there was no arrest, there was nothing. But my guy simply will not let go. And, you know, it, my hunch is, and I've not been able to find out, I think the fellow driving the car was just a good old country boy who didn't know what to do. And there was no criminal action whatsoever. There was none, whatever. And so my guy, I've told him, it's kind of like we're talking about, the country boy probably has no program of any kind. So I told him, I said, why don't you take the initiative? You know, this guy came into a restaurant where he and his, this, my guy and his wife were eating. He got sick and had to leave the restaurant. It's that, that, that bad. And I said, why don't you take the initiative and you reach out to him? Because he probably doesn't know how. But I can't get him to do it. But he lives with that every day. Every day. Affects everything about him. 25 years sober, he's not a dumb man at all. But I cannot get him to, to do that. So it re really is a, a tough deal to deal with when you've got that kind of circuitous thing. Yeah, yeah tough stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, Mark. Yeah. Tom, I, uh, I had a person make uh, amends to me, and I have uh, a tough time. Yeah. Uh, uh, my daughter died in a canoe accident up in Hyder, Alaska, her and her friend. And they, uh, we still had their life jackets on. And they went to bother. And they figured they were dead. And in two, two to three minutes, the two of them were dead. Thank you. And 
that. I went back up ten years later for the anniversary. My family went up. And as I was standing there one day, a guy came over to me and said, Are you Mr. Grant? And I said, Yes. He said, I have to make amends to you. He's not in the program right now. He said, I want to make amends to you. And I said, Oh. He said, I remember the day your daughter and friend died over my body. He said, I was going fishing that day. And I was in a hurry. He said, I heard the screaming. But he said, I didn't stop. You know, if he could have saved him out or not, I had, I had no idea. But I think that he made me more of a victim by telling me that and then himself. I think, that, you know, I have a, I wish I'd never known that. Mm -hmm. I would have been better out for it. You know, he relieved himself, but I, I got, I'm very hurt over that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was clearly a lose-lose situation. It sure was. Yeah, that's a, it's unfortunate that, but you, know, you, you know, people are not equipped. You know, just, some people just don't know how to do it. You know. Well, they, no, very few people know how to do it, unless you're in something like we are. Yeah, but that's a, I can fully understand what you're talking about. That's for sure. That. Yeah. Well, we better move, Brian. Real. Quick. Yeah, now I am sorry about that. Yeah. Brian, we better make her quick. We're gonna have to move on that now. Okay. Well, it says when we get halfway through, we don't even have to do it. Have Just get halfway through. Yeah, eight and nine. If we've been painstaking about this phase of our development, that's what it is. It's just following up on 8 and 9. We'll be amazed before we have through. And so, you know, just, just making a start, you know, it, it, it starts to deliver. Yeah, there's not one fell swoop, you know. But I'll I guarantee you every promise in there resonates in my life today. And so it happens, but it, it just, it's just a, it's a slow process. You know, some of them you can't fix. You know, just got to, just got to, you live with it, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. So, yeah, there. What, well, let's, let's run into something else. That's, this would be a. I do like that area because I think that truly is a freedom thing. An awful lot of people stop at this and, and don't get around to making amends and miss the freedom. Um, how do. I think I'm going to save this. I got one here. I had picked out, but I'm going to save it till in the morning, and we'll finish up. I want to finish up with a flurry. I never did finish telling you what your homework was, but I, I'll go over to the board again. The uh, um, this is hope for Bill wrote this hope for something. Oh, it relapses, and. Uh, let me, let me just make some brief comments about that whole business of, of relapse. We call them slips in the old days, but relapse is a more fancy term. But it's, what you're talking about, getting drunk is what it's about. You, know, you can call it whatever you want to, but that's what it is. And uh, that we do have, you know, the, the thing, what it looks to me like, just from observation, is that the more you slip, the more you slip. And it's just sort of a, a self self perpetuating kind of a thing that, that, that happens. Now, I've never done it, but I've worked with God knows how many people who have. And it's tough to come back. Um, let, me, let me frame it with something that I'd sure like to share with you that uh, a, a lot of people who have, who have slips and come back pursue an impossible fantasy. That is that they're going to start where they left off, and they won't. It is absolutely impossible. It can't happen. It, so there's you know there's only one first introduction to AA. You can get introduced to it a hundred times, but there's only one first one. There's only one first honeymoon. You can have a lot of honeymoons, but you'll only have one first one. And so a lot of people come back to AA that, that have had trouble. 
And they get into this vain notion that they're going to recapture what they had, and, and it won't happen. And um, there's, I had a guy down in my area that um, I don't know, well, I, I don't know why about it, but I, I, I reluctantly butt into somebody else's business. It has to be a good reason, like I think ought to is a good reason. And so, <laughs> and I did, we had this guy, he was 32 years sober and drank. Now, it's devastating for anybody, but when you're 32 years sober in the fellowship and you lose it, that is a long fall and a terrific trip back. And I didn't know this guy well, but I, I was generally aware of him. And I'd see him floating around. He hadn't landed anywhere. He was just kind of floating around. And I heard his story from somebody else. And I got thinking about, what is this guy going through? You know, trying to come back after 32 years in the program. And uh, so one night, I just, I grabbed, he was over at our, at our group. And I stopped him. I said, can I talk to you about something? He said, sure. And I, 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 I told him the thing that... There's, in a, there's a guy quoted in the book, uh, you, you know, William James, who's one of Bill's favorite authors and one of his many favorite authors, but he, he wrote a, a lot of stuff that Bill picked up on it. And, and one of the things, I, you know, I, I wondered for years, because I watched dear friends beat their brains out trying to get back into recovery, to no avail. And so it always was bugging to me why that was so, so difficult. And I read something that William James wrote one time that cleared it up for me instantly. And what he wrote was, no state of mind, once obtained and lost, can ever be regained and be the same. Well, my God, that's absolutely true. What I just said, you can't have a second run at a first thing. I mean, you can't. And so what James wrote was brilliant in its simplicity. And the minute I read that, I understood the futility of that effort of coming back. And, and my God, man, I'd seen more tragic cases than I cared to see of people who would wind up commit suicide and just the futility of the whole thing and go through that anguish. And uh, the, uh, so I went to the, this guy and, and, and I said to him as gently as I knew how, that, that I knew he was having a, a rough time. And that and, and I cited James's quote and, and conversationally cited it to him. And he thanked me. I, I knew I noticed he wasn't just warm and gushing, but, but he wasn't angry. I mean he said he really appreciated me talking with him. And uh, but I didn't like his follow up. You know, he just did acted a little distant. So I went to him again and said said, I want to take you to lunch. And I'll buy it. <laughs> so he said, that's the deal. So we, we, we went. And, uh, and I bought, too, by the way. And he, <laughs> he's rich, but he couldn't get anything out of it. So, but anyway, he showed up. And uh, he said, before you start with whatever you, you wanted to meet about, he said, let me tell you something. I owe you some amends. I said, for what? And uh, he said, and he cited my conversation with him a little earlier. He said, I thought what you told me was that I didn't have a chance. That's how he interpreted what I was saying. I didn't communicate it well. He, I told him he was hopeless and that he was screwed and he would not make it. And that's what he heard. And he said, I finally got it through my head what you were talking about. And, and so he said, I'm really glad that you want to get me to lunch. I want to get that straight. And... Um, so, yeah, I'm not sponsoring him, but he, he said, uh, uh, will you help me get into some activity? And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you're talking to the right guy. Mm -hmm. And so I got him into a little bit of activity. Got him going to a prison. Yeah, that, that'll, that'll light up your, your, your life when you start doing something. Like that. But, it, but you, 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 you see the dilemma that guy had? Now, he's still sober. Yeah, he's a member of our group. I, now, I hope he'll stay sober. But he's got a huge comeback to make. And uh, if he can do that and regroup and get back in, my God, I hope so. But, 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 but what a deal, eh? That once, once you lose it and then try to get it, 
It is really an elusive thing. That, that, it's that thing of trying to recapture it. They, uh, so what do you do with them? You know, I, I, you know, that, I don't think there's any panacea for it. it one thing is, it, it, is that thing of understanding that, that we've got to help people understand that they've got to get a brand new start. What I always tell them is you won't get back what you had. You've got to go for more or settle for less. It won't be the same. And so that's what I want them to focus in on is that you've got to accept the fact that you're going to have a new reality. And you decide which it is. You know. And that's the only thing I know to tell them. That, that, uh, but that, as far as getting them involved, that's the only way I know that is. You've got to get them to start. And I don't, I don't know that I took that guy to prison so he could quit thinking he was the worst case in town. I wouldn't be able to see that a heck of a lot of people worse than him. And uh, so far he's doing okay, but it's a, it's a long trip back. So I don't, I don't certainly don't have any, uh, any, any, any uh, panacea for, for people who are chronic slippers. I have to just be honest with them, welcome them back, you know, get them into the fold, try to get them into some deep water. Yeah. I just to add to that, Tom, I uh, had six years and I ended up reading <coughs> And the primary reason was because I never did the steps. Because uh, you had to do the step. Yeah, yeah, when I came back, uh, the only thought, uh, the beacon, the message that was coming through me loud and clear was that I had to get back to basics or I was going to die. Yeah. And so I did two developers back to back in the first year and a half, and it changed my life. And for the first two years, all I did was focus on home group, sponsorship, getting involved in my home group, really getting down to the nitty gritty, back to basics. And I haven't looked back since. It's been 14 years, and my life's just fantastic. Good deal. Good deal. You went for something more. You went for something more. Well, I just, I think what I did was I just absolutely streamlined it and just got focused like a laser on it. What I needed to do to stay sober and just simplify the hell out of it. Sure. And just get right to basics. And that's the way mm-hmm. I've, I've carried on in my sobriety since. You know, mm-hmm. all this stuff going on out in life and the world and, and jobs and money and women, all this stuff is all out here. But mm-hmm. my center is AA and the principles of alcohol. Yeah. yeah, I would suspect that's in sharp contrast to what it was before you left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good deal. Glad you're back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, lately, in my home group, there's been this emphasis on God may you find him or her or it now, in the now. But all we have is the now. There's a little pamphlet that we have yesterday, today, and tomorrow. All we have is the now, like today. And to me, that theme in my home group lately has been so meaningful, so powerful, so helpful. And I guess it's not very powerful. There's a sort of pop site, you know, being it now. But that line in the big book, May You Find Me Now, is so powerful if we sort of focus on that. That's all we have. And in making amends, yesterday is like, I, I can't fix it. The future is an amazing. It's, it's a sunrise, maybe a good night, cars, maybe not. The now is what I only have. Did you come with Well, I could agree more. That, that the only thing we got right now. And, uh, and, 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 and that whole notion of finding the yeah, I, I was an agnostic when I came in, and, and I didn't believe anything. And uh, over time, I came to believe that, that a power could restore me, what the power was. And, and it was uh, different than anything I'd ever run from in the past, and it was, uh, was very real. So mine was not a sudden, brutal jump. It was a gradual kind of, of believing. And uh, it was very important for me was, was not only finding out, but starting where I was. You know, because I couldn't start as some faithful servant. I was somebody just peeping through the fence. You know, and so I had to start. You know, I knew there was a power, and, and I, what I had to do is get, get really connected to that. I do that every day of my life. 
I did it this morning on my inner spring mattress down in the cabin. <laughs> I said, God, can't you beat this? <laughs> yeah, help me, man. <laughs> yeah, but I have to do that all the time, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Uh, hi, Grand Al Paul. Um, yeah, right. I, I was thinking about, I got sober back east in the States, and um, when I moved back here, there's two big differences that I noticed about uh, relapsing. And back there, they don't welcome back. Um, people aren't welcomed back. Like it's, it's like you're either new or you're, you know, or you're in the group. And, and I wanted to know what you thought about that, because it, it seems to me a bit different than, um, than the, the, there's nothing formal in the literature that talks about welcoming back. And the second thing was, um, um, back there they counted days, like one to 90, and then six months, and it was a really big deal in every meeting I went to was the day count, and then, you know, six months, and people were really like, Fuck, I don't want to count my days again, you know, like it was a, it seemed to be to keep people on the beam for, for that really uncertain period. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that out here. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to know your opinion on those things. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, best I can tell that whole business about like giving those little recognition things started with Sister Ignatia. And uh, she used to do the guys in St. Thomas <laughs> that when they'd leave, she'd give them that little medal and you know, so you bring it back before you drink, you know, that. I, I think that's where that whole idea of ship stuff started. We uh, there, there's no generic description for what we do back east. You know, we there's as different as there are groups. You know, our group uh, we 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 really welcome people to our group. We don't care if they just got out of jail or Yale or whatever, but we welcome the people no matter where they come from. You'll find that more where you've got a real group as opposed to a casual gathering. You know, that, you know, casual gathering, who welcomes who? You know, I mean, you don't even know who the members are. And uh, so, you, you know, a lot of times in this casual meeting, I, I'll give you an example of what, what it looks like. Now, I'm a kind of a, an outgoing type of fellow. You know, that's how I got over being isolated when I started reaching out to other people. And, I, and so I make it a practice wherever I go to. Uh, I, went, I was in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, I was on a business trip, and, and uh, but I had a little time in the afternoon, so I went over to, I knew where the club was, so I went over there. Typical afternoon club crowd. They're standing sitting around reading the paper, or playing uh, cards or whatever. Now I was kind of like the psychiatrist in the burlesque show. You know, I was watching the audience instead of the, the, the dancers, you know. And so I went around and deliberately made physical contact with every person in the room, everyone. Didn't say anything. I just was want to see you know, how this afternoon crowd would deal. I was decently dressed, but it shouldn't matter. But I went by, not one single person even acknowledged my presence. No hellos, no, you know, open that cup of coffee, nothing. Went over to the bar, and uh, the, the, the guy working there was talking to another fellow, sat there a few minutes. And he said, you want something? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'd like a coffee. And so I got a coffee. Now, that's not me, normally. Yeah, I got the coffee, went back to the hotel. And that night I was going to meet, so I came back over. This time, I did the same thing. Only instead of walking by, I went to every table and interrupted whatever they were doing. I didn't care what they were doing. They were welcoming me is what they were doing, whether they meant to or not. So I'd just go over there. I'm Tom Ivester from Southern Pine, North Carolina. Well, it was a different club, eh? A different club. They were as warm and welcoming as me once I got them awake. You know, they, <laughs> <laughs> they were great. But they weren't used to doing that. You know, they had a new member that night who was coming back to his first meeting. Who do you think they asked to take him to a meeting? Somebody you got to wake up and lead to the car? No. They asked the guy from down south that looked alive. So I took the guy to his first meeting at that. You know, the, the point is that, that you know, I think you gotta, you got to, I'm not going to stand there and watch the fellowship die. I'm going to move in. And if I see something needs to be done, I'll do it. Yeah. I went, I went to speak to a group a while back down. 
I don't know, we're weird sometimes. I would, would speak to a group down in my area. And it, appeared, it looked like a dance, you know, when you went in. Everybody was lined up around the wall. Yeah, just like you would at a high school dance or something. And so I went around, I'm making around, you know, greeting everybody. And uh, I'm welcoming them to their group. You know? <laughs> and so I got around the circle. A woman came across the floor. And she said, can I ask you something personal? I said, sure, what is it? She said, what do you sell? <laughs> I said, I don't then I started to say I don't sell anything. I said, oh, wait a minute, yeah, I do. I sell recovery, and we got a real deal on it. Yeah. And that's exactly right. You know, I'm not going to stand by and watch Alcoholics Anonymous wither and die. If I see something needs to be done, I'm going to do it if it's not being done. I don't care whose group it is. Yeah, that's just what I want to be. I, I don't want to be part of an unwelcoming, unfriendly kind of a group of people. I just, I won't, I just won't do that. And so, But that's just me. I hope you'll do the same thing. Because sometimes it can absolutely... I, I'll tell you one other thing that I do just as a matter of, of course. Uh, I'm not a fan, a, friend, a fan of just open discussion meetings, you know, where you talk about what the bitch took when she left and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just not a fan of that. You know. And uh, if I go into a meeting where I see that's what it is, I never leave. I'm going to work inside the tent. I'm not going to get out and throw rocks. I, I'm going to work inside the tent. So I'll sit down at the table. And uh, if somebody makes the mistake of calling on me, <laughs> <laughs> Or, or if it comes around that ring around the Rosie's deal, when it gets to me, I act I act like I'm deaf, dumb, and blind, that I haven't heard a single thing that's been said, and then I'll start talking about what I think ought to be talked about in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I tell you something, I, I'm I'm never insulting to or confrontational to people or correcting people. What I'm doing is demonstrating what I believe an AA group ought to be about, or what a member ought to be about in a group. And so I'll start talking about something that has to do with recovery. And not one single time have I ever seen it go back to what it was. Every single time. Yeah, it start right back in, on, and you got a new deal. I'm not the only guy frustrated there. I mean, my God, man, how many people want to sit around and commiserate about the poodle died or something, you know? I mean, you know, you can say, I'm sorry about that, and then move on, you know? But that, that's what I do. And because you'll find that. I'm not found in a pact of every state in the Union. It's not just down east thing. I mean, that, that's, that's a, a widespread kind of a problem. I think every one of us, you know, are either, we're either part of that coldness or we do something to try to make it different. And so that's what I do. And I'm, you know, I'm just one guy. But by golly, I'm one. And I can, de- I can demonstrate you know that that there is a better way to do that thing. So that's what I do, just as a just as a, a way of operating. The it's fun sometimes, you know, with with, uh, with, with what happens. And it really just I did something about it. It's, it's called leadership, is what you call it. That's all it is. It's leadership. If you want to see it done, take the initiative and start making it get done. You know, you don't have to boss anybody around. All you got to do is set an example. And the first thing you know, somebody won't talk to you. Yeah, it's amazing what happens. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, my name is Kevin. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Kevin. Um, I'm not a week sober yet, and this is my second. Uh, this is my second run at it, and uh, I was recently in a community of AA that I wasn't thrilled about, and now I've moved to Vancouver, which has inspired me. But um, I'm scared that it's just a geographical change and that I'm not done. And I was wondering if maybe you could comment on that a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> well, geographical stuff is, uh, is it, and, and mobility is an order of the day, you know, because we, we're a mobile society. I, I'll tell you what I've had to do over, how long were you sober the first time? Uh, three months. Okay. Well, your big, the biggest thing is to, is to find a place where you feel comfortable. You know, that, that's very important, find a place you're comfortable. If anybody that's older, I, I'll tell you what I've had to do as an older member, and I wouldn't advocate this for you at this point, obviously, but 
What I've moved, I've, I've moved a number of times in, in my recovery. Every time I get a new job, I usually have to relocate somewhere. And uh, every... Five more minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> I don't hear that. I hear more, more. <laughs> well, <laughs> next week. <laughs> but you, you, what I've had to do, and the book described it doggone well, at the, right toward the end of the end of the 164 pages, is what do you do when you get to town? They were talking about starting a, which I've had that privilege too. But when I go to a town, I have a criteria for what I'm looking for in a group. I want a three legacy group. I'm not interested in a one dimensional group. If the group is all about me and mine, count me out. Because that's just a piece of one legacy. And so when I go to a town, I honest to God want to find a group. But what I find is great difficulty in finding a three legacy group. And I hope it's different in Vancouver, but it's sure not in North Carolina. You know, if somebody comes into my town looking for a, 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 for, for, for a, a group, we've got a couple. We, mine's one of them that, that they can come to and they'll find a solid AA meeting. But you find an awful lot that are just, in all honesty, ought not to be flying the flag. But I mean, it's just, it, everything stimulates new thoughts with me, but... I was doing a work, a little work panel type of thing at, at a, on a professional deal. And uh, I was on a panel with a psychiatrist. And I did my thing, and then he followed me. And when he got up, and, we, and it was on alcoholism, dealing with it. When he got up, he said, I know, he was the tiredest looking man I think I've ever seen. You know what I mean? You see people that are just beat, I mean, just sagging. And, and, uh, well, that's what he looked like. And he went up there and he said, I worked with alcoholics and uh, who've got other problems and some who are just straight alcoholics. He said, I know AA is the place for it. But he said, it, it honestly seems to me that when I send them to AA, they come back worse. And uh, he said, I don't understand it. You know, what is that about? Well, I didn't want to answer. I just got off the stage, you know, I, and he followed me. Well... Sitting there, nobody says anything. Well, the guy is desperately asking for help. And there were a number of AA members in there from that town. Nobody budged. So I stuck my hand up. And, and, and I said, I understand what you're talking about. And you know, the only thing I would tell you is that you're going to find that. That you got to understand everything that fly, flies the flag is not AA. It covers a lot of stuff. And so you're going to find some that are good, healthy places. You're going to find some that are, that are that major in the illness. And I said, what I would suggest you do is get acquainted with two members that you trust, two members that you trust that will give you good guidance. When you've got somebody and you want to know where to take them, call them. Tell them what you're dealing with. If you're dealing with somebody that, that's paranoid, you're not going to send him into some sort of confrontational kind of a thing. You're going to send him to a different kind of a meeting. So that's why you don't expect him to get educated enough to know which door to go in. But if you can make contact in the fellowship and get guidance on that, just like we get guidance from them on, on dealing with stuff. So that, I mean, that's, that's not directly addressing what you, what you were talking about, but that's the main thing. That's what I do even as an old-timer. When I go in, I check out the terrain. I find a group if I possibly can. And if I can't, I start one. And uh, that's what I've had to do for a lot of years now. So, but shoot, man, hang in there. And uh, you can start with, uh, you know, the guys that started the first group didn't have but a week. So uh, you ride up with them. You know? So you <laughs> go on in there and make a difference. You know? <laughs> and what will happen is you'll get moving real quick. Yeah. 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 Last one, Brian. Sometimes I go to meetings, and I don't even hear a word that's said. The mind just like squirrel or whatever. You know, like, uh, how do you get, like, uh, focus in your meeting? Because you know, sometimes that happens. Does that ever happen? I'll tell you what's helped me. Listening is an art. It is an art. And it is a powerful, powerful art. 
I learned a value of listening. I, I, was, I was taking a college speech course, and I got that as listening. What the importance of listening. I had a good friend who taught listening in workshops. You know, that it's a powerful deal. Where you, uh, when you give somebody your attention, you're giving them yourself. And it is a huge gift to give somebody your undivided attention. What a, what a gift you can give. You can actually, I've done it, you can actually influence a speaker by the way you listen. It sounds weird, but if you want him to talk about something, you know, all you got to do is just respond to what you want to hear and ignore what you don't. And the first thing you know, he's going to be singing your song. Yeah. <laughs> now, I don't know how to be telling you that since I do a lot of speaking. I, I mean, people going to have me singing Dixie up here or something like that. <laughs> But that's what I do, just recognize the value of it and learn how to listen to people. But this most important gift you can give somebody is your undivided attention. Powerful thing. You can influence literally what somebody does. So I, I think it's a great tool. Well, we've got to take a break. The boss man has spoken. <laughs>